Um, but I have a few uh, of my kind of pet peeves that I want to get off my chest before I get into a, my main question that I've been dealing with actually in my writing, which is this problem I have with science in general. So first let me get these things off my chest and then I'll move into something maybe a little more, a little more deep. Um, I've been, as I started looking at science fiction, I've been a science fiction reader pretty much all my life, but as I started looking at the analysis of science fiction, um, uh, there was this you know, kind of presumption that it all began with Jules Verne and H.G. Wells, and there was sometimes a mention of Mary Shelley, who we've, we've heard today. Um, and this disturbed me in um, at least two ways. Um, the first um, reason it disturbed me is that in a former life, I was a Scandinavian linguist. Linguist. And in that capacity, I translated the book um, Principles for Oral Narrative Research by Axel Ulrich, which outlines the epic laws of oral narratives. And in very many um, senses, science fiction today um, has a rich and long human history. Uh, the second thing that um, disturbed me is that um, this led me to look um, for women in science fiction um, because it's always frustrating to me to see the predominance of a male vertebrate in all of these kind of, you know, discussions. So um, just um, as I will get to in a moment, the emergence of the genre as we know it today is said to be the result of the particular dynamics of the early 19th century, industrialization, colonialization, and technical advances. On the other hand, um, the modern development of the genre can be traced back millennia to folk traditions of narratives of the fantastic, like the epic of Gilgamesh and Beowulf, even the Hindu epic of Ramayana from the fifth to fourth century BC that included flying machines that traveled to space or underwater and the destruction of entire cities with advanced weapon systems. So in a very real sense, Science fiction is part of our human heritage of storytelling. And already very early, there were visions of new worlds that were constructed and then passed down. So getting back to women in science fiction, um, I just want to mention a couple that maybe you're unfamiliar with. Margaret Cavendish wrote this book called The Blazing World that was published in 1666. And this could arguably be the first science fiction ever written, at least in the Western context, although the genre is a bit fluid. Um, it tells the story of a woman who passes from the North Pole into a world populated by talking animals and fishmen and other kinds of astonishing creatures, and this group of creatures um, declares her an empress, and then she leads them um, to an invasion of her home world. And this is kind of a classic portal story um, and a very a truly inventive work. Um, and so besides Mary Shelley, we also have Mary E. Bradley, and she published a utopian novel called Mizora in 1880 about a hidden, hidden civilization inside the earth that was accessible, again, through the North Pole. I don't understand why this was a recurring kind of theme. Um, so the society that she found is advanced with things like video phones, artificial meat, and climate control. Listen, this is 1880, remember? And the citizens live in perfect harmony with no crime, no violence, and needless to say, the society was exclusively female. So they had eliminated men at some point in the past, and then they thrived um, successfully without them. Um, then there is the book, The Citadel of Fear, by Gertrude Barrows Bennett, that was published in 1918 under a male pseudonym, uh, Francis Stevens. The story is like sci-fi, it's horror, it's fantasy, and is about explorers who come across a lost city in South America, where an evil god creates strange creatures by a mysterious means. 
Um, and the fact that this author is so little known today is a crime, really, because technically she's a much better writer than H.P. Lovecraft, whom she influenced and predated. So I could go on and on um, um, with more familiar authors that you probably know, um, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, Virginia Woolf, Ursula Le Guin, Margaret Atwood, Doris Lessing, P.D. James, Octavia Butler, Nalo Hopkinson, Nita Okorafor, Ken Lo Karen Lord, and N.K. Jameson. Okay, so I got that off my chest. <laughs> I want to go back to the emergence of contemporary and complex, um, this contemporary and complex genre today, and, I, and ask the question whether it is a product of a particular zeitgeist at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. So far, Jules Verne and H.G. Wells were mentioned by me and others today, and their works were written about the same time, although they never met each other. Each of these authors came from prominent colonial powers of their day, so great empires that were going to bring civilization to the rest of the world and decide the future of humanity. After World War II, two new superpowers or empires arose, the US and the USSR. And once again, we see great writers of science fiction from these powers dominating the literature, Isaac Asimov, Frank Herbert, and others. After the end of the Cold War, it is a little less clear, although with China on the rise, there are outstanding new sci-fi authors like what um, like um, Thomas mentioned this morning, Liu Cixin and the Three Body Problem and its hit TV series, The Wandering Earth. So I'm just wondering if there's some kind of a connection here between power politics and, and uh, imagining alternative futures. And it's interesting to note that among the over 1,100 movies that were produced in Nazi Germany, not one was science fiction. You know? <coughs> Maybe they were living, producing their own <laughs> dystopia. So um, what resonates with us about this genre? Um, Ray Bradbury said, I often use the metaphor of Perseus and the head of Medusa when I speak of science fiction. I'm so wondering if my young students have read any of the Greek mythology and have heard of Perseus and Medusa. <coughs> well, Natalia, you're, it's, you're shaking your head yes, so um, I hope some of you know what this story is about. Um, to continue with Ray Bradbury's quote, he said, instead of looking into the face of truth, you look over your shoulder into the bronze surface of a reflecting shield then you reach back with your sword and you cut off the head of Medusa. Of course, this was one of the most awkward epic battles in ancient history, but it succeeded. Um, um, this is uh, one of the main reasons of what makes um, great science fiction. It is the ability to reflect us and our truths back to ourselves. And it's an entry into history, evolution, psychology, philosophy, religion, and religious struggles like transgression and redemption, free will, politics, economics, sociology, critical thinking, and of course, science and technology. So science fiction explores what it means to be human, non-human, and all kinds of combinations thereof. Um, science fiction constantly provokes the question, could this really happen? or what if. So this brings me to another not so random thought that I like to explore um, in my writing and as I said, it deals with the problem of science. Um, as, you might be ex as might be expected, many scientists are characterized by, the, by their explicit or implicit techno-optimism, especially when the solutions advocated are effectively presented as a kind of silver bullet to deal with some currently recognized crisis. Um, the quality of healthy doubt and uncertainty reg regarding the methodology of science and its ability to enhance its capacity to move beyond its conventional unquestioned patterns seems remarkably low to me. Uncertainty and probability are not apparent in these kind of can-do approaches to planetary issues such as global warming. The technological fixes proposed within the current techno-optimistic mindset don't take into account 
the disastrous consequences considered to be of low probability, as is discussed by, you know, Nassim Talib, I'm sure many of you know um, the black swan effect. In this countervailing kind of spirit of optimism, presumably an analogous arguments have been made for the serendipitous consequences of other events that were considered to be low probability. And I've written about this regarding the economic um, fi and financial crises and the predominance of what I call dysfunctional thinking in which we all participate to a greater or lesser extent today. So at this institute at IASC, we are always talking about out-of-the-box thinking. Um, and that means coming up with uh, contrasting approaches that need attention, recognition, and validation. There are other ways of knowing with which scientists are uncomfortable, which nevertheless could constitute a source of maybe optimism, maybe hope, especially in the cases where science and technology seemingly have little of immediate relevance to offer. Where are the surprises today of a degree corresponding to that associated with the much cited bohr pauli exchange? I'm sure you all heard this. Niels Bohr declared in response to Wolfgang Pauli, quote, we all agreed that your theory is crazy. The question which divides us is whether it is crazy enough to have a chance of being correct. My own feeling is that it is not crazy enough. To which Freeman Dyson added, when a great innovation appears, it will almost certainly be in a muddled, incomplete, and confusing form. To the discoverer himself, it will, only, it will be only half understood. To everyone else, it will be a mystery. For any speculation which does not at first glance look crazy, there is no hope. So perhaps this crazy speculation can be found elsewhere today. The quantum physicist who was mentioned this morning, um, Anton Zeilinger, noted, so far science is guided by the, in my eyes, fallacious Cartesian cut between res cognitans I think I have a slide here, yes. Res cognitans, that means mental substance or consciousness, and res extensa, extended and unthinking thing. It is wrong to believe that the world out there exists independent of our observation, but it is equally wrong to believe that it exists only because of our observation. So we have to and we will find a completely new way of looking at the world which will fully transcend our present materialistic paradigm. After all, we have learned in quantum physics that all concepts of material existence evaporate. In the end, we are left with probability fields, probabilities of the results of observations. Framed in this way, there is an implication that there might be some kind of cognitive and strategic gateway between the seemingly opposed worldviews of science and religion. The nature of that gateway, in terms of the paradigm shift that it implies, would clearly be vital to a new kind of response to the world without, that is, res extensa, through a new relationship with the world within, which is res cogitans. Um, Zeilinger's indication could well enable a radical reframing of the, of the supposedly external problems like global warming, resources, poverty, etc., in the light of new understanding of the mindsets that in some way sustained them, whether in terms of new insight or in terms of new comprehension of more traditionally worded insights. As such, this could prove surprisingly fruitful in what is essentially a stuck conceptual situation in which many would argue that global leadership has lost the plot in its deep denial. So any optimism dependent on the elimination of those that offer a contrary view should be considered to be fundamentally inadequate. I want to take a following quote from um, something that's called a call to prepare together for uncertain futures from the Phoenix Project. This is what they had to say. 
a bunch of uh, intellectuals from the Phoenix Project got together and, and came up with this observation. An undercurrent of conversations is bubbling in all sectors among business people, government officials, futurists, activists, citizens, over back fences and blogs. There is a growing sense of crisis that neither mainstream leaders nor the public quite know what to do with. Many of us are talking about it in our own circles, separately, out of the public eye. Very little of this conversation is visible in the mainstream press and political debates, so we don't realize how many other people and institutions are discussing it. Practically, everyone has an opinion about this uneasy topic of crisis. Indeed, there is a widespread legit legitimate disagreement about the extent to which a perfect storm of complementary crises may be emerging in the near future, involving, but not limited to, peak oil, accelerating climate change, serious economic disruption, loss of democracy, significant resource depletion, including water and land, international instability and terrorism, and increasingly disruptive technology developments and the wild card events such as pandemics. Um, I've written about this in a sense um, because other people have formulated it um, as the great disruption. So when you know, social uh, crises face the wall of environmental crises, we have something called the great disruption, which they hear called the perfect storm. Um, Donald D. Hoffman argued that evidence is mounting that the mind-body problem requires revision of deeply held presuppositions. And the most compelling evidence to date is the large and growing set of proposals now on offer. All are non-starters. They are, to quote Pauli, not even wrong. <laughs> and we have yet to see our first genuine scientific theory of the mind-body problem. So the obstacle may not only be in our genes, but in our presuppositions. Um, tinkering with one's presuppositions doesn't require technology, just a ruthless reconsideration of what one considers to be obviously true. Science has risen to this task before, but it's a question now whether it will rise to this challenge again. And it's not easy, even in the light of compelling data and theories, um, to let go of what once seemed obviously true. I write about this as well in the kind of uh, deconstruction of scientific revolutions and how they came about. Another mode uh, might have emerged from the consideration of adaptive cycle and the consequent need for resilience in adaptation. We haven't talking, spoken about resilience today yet, um, of the probability. So resilience in anticipation for societal collapse. The issue is how resilience in an adaptive cycle is to be understood in relation to knowledge and belief systems as distinct from the adaptive cycle in social and environmental systems. Homer Dixon insists on the need to explore the means by which psychosocial systems could be designed to degrade gracefully in anticipating the collapse phase of such cycles. So this design characteristic is now carefully built into some technical systems that are vulnerable to collapse, although um, the pursuit of efficiency sometimes precludes this in other cases. So how might systems of knowledge be designed to degrade gracefully only in the or if or it only comes through in the case of aging scientists who experience memory loss and senility? Um, in many cases, scientific revolutions only occur when the previous generation of scientists is dead. So how is it that there is little optimism for transcending the constraints of the scientific method itself, calling for little further improvement, as is the case in, with other belief systems that science tends to disparage? When scientists are so optimistic about their theoretical and technical capacities in response to the challenges of the future, how is it that the ability to explain or predict the differences between them, which is evident in their responses, is so modest, especially when such differences are rarely a significant factor in informing their optimism? Um, I want to get um, 
quickly into a discussion of not knowing, not knowing and uncertainty. Um, in its simplest form, not knowing may only be a question of ignorance and not seeking to know, so, or a failure to understand. So typically, this would be associated with a form of complacency, contentment with an habitual pattern of thought. And this might occur with the best informed as with the least informed. The challenge of understanding a mathematical theorem might be a sophisticated version of the form. So not knowing is different. Uh, not knowing of a different kind occurs with the recognition of the possible inadequacy of what is known and the need to explore beyond its frontiers as motivated by curiosity. However, that is to be scientifically divine, defined and typically this is what drives research. Um, the need to respond to anomalies and to challenges calling for unforeseen forms of remedial action. So it also drives the search for certainty through non-scientific belief systems from divination to religion and we talked about this this morning. So, not knowing what to do might be distinct from the previous cases, especially for any individual who is kind of tortured by existential doubt. And it might be a fruitful admission on the part of collectivities and leadership to guard against tendencies to assume the, in, the adequacy of a strategy in situations where it may be quite inappropriate. The doubt associated with accepting ignorance of what we what to do may be a prerequisite for adequate dialogue amongst those who together can conceive a way forward. So no doubt, no dialogue. Um, in the recognized absence of certainty and adequate knowledge, a precautious attitude may be cultivated. Um, the kind of not knowing associated with the precautionary principle. This is, of course, a strategic posture favored by those sensitive to the possibility of system, systemic surprises that arise from unforeseen combinations of events. Um, the posture may also be associated with any kind of form of risk management, um, raising the issue of how much weight to be attached to what is not known. It is, of course, significant to game playing and in its more technical and strategic sense. So not knowing may also be cultivated as an attitudinal and philosophical style that questions the value of seeking a high level of certainty regarding the medium or long-term future. And here the issue is the attitude required for living in the present moment in terms of the information available, accepting what might subsequently emerge, however disruptive, and it specifically challenges the sense of insecurity associated with the need to know in order to control. So each of these modes may be simultaneously operative to some degree um, all the time, and each affects the need to ask questions, to answer them in the manner in which we do so. Together, they constitute a knowledge process that may well be fundamental to the sustainability of a knowledge system that underlies society. So clearly, a healthy balance is required between them, and any excessive development of one at the expense of others is liable to prove dysfunctional. And I think we can see many cases of this today, of the imbalance of one of these modes of, of um, not knowing. Um, Excessive preoccupation with knowing and the need for certainty is, for example, typical of obsessive over-control. Um, I wanted to look at something called res um, cognita and res incognita, so uh, reframing the edge of the known. One way of thinking about such disparate forms of not knowing is that of the logical quadrilemma, especially favored in Eastern cultures. Um, this framework might be used to make the following distinctions. Knowing, not knowing, knowing and not knowing, and neither knowing or not knowing. So together, these pose the question of the nature of the question-answer process and the psychosocial engagement with it. So as a psychoactive pattern, they are together a challenge to any sense of identity, whether individual or collective, and they're dependent on particular forms of questioning and answering. They call for a kind of dynamic response that avoids dependence on one or the other, but requires an appropriate dance between them. 
I'm going to get more into dance in a little bit. They might fruitfully be considered as mapped onto a complex plane to highlight the complexity of the boundary between the known and the unknown. Okay. If that was a little too complicated, let me tell you, let me read you something that I'm sure you've heard before. Reports that say that something hasn't happened are always interesting to me because as we know, there are known knowns, there are things we know we know, we also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know, but there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. And if one looks throughout the history of our country and other free countries, it is the latter category that tend to be the difficult ones. You remember who said that, yeah? Rumsfeld, Donald Rumsfeld. And actually, it is these unknown unknowns that are what keep me awake at night. Um, so this much stated, cited remark has been reviewed in the light of its kind of inadvertent wisdom. Sometimes we can be certain about things. Sometimes we know the direction to take, but are aware of gaps in our life. And sometimes we're just stumbling around in the dark. So what might traverse individual or collective? Will this be the discovery of the pioneers of the 21st century? And should possibilities be the focus of an optimism beyond the edge to deal with the current cognitive challenge of polarized thinking? Um, like optimism versus pessimism, positive versus negative, solutions versus problems, intellectual abstractions or operational praxis, hope mongers or doom mongers. Is there anyone with some way to bridge this kind of polarized thinking. So one of my favorite um, writers came up with this. It's called the avoid dance. So from a Western perspective, the fundamental cognitive implications of void are more meaningful in terms of the following uh, characteristics. I want you to think out the void. Understandings of ignorance in comparison with knowledge or even wisdom and the implications for the learning process. The scientific and cultural significance associated with the discovery of the concept of zero or nothing. And you know, I have had this um, idea um, for the last couple years, the next conference I want to have is going to be on nothingness, on nothing. I want to have a conference and discussion about nothing. Yeah. Um, the function of communication holes <coughs> around which communication, communication circulates within groups in large institutional structures. The astrophysical concept of void as the empty spaces between filaments, the largest scale structures in the universe, together with the associated phenomena of black holes. The architectural principles associated with void creation by arching structures, notably those that are spherically sym symmetrical, as with those based on principles of tensional integrity. The topological significance associated with the torus. I don't know. Here's a torus up there. Okay. Um, a torus is a surface of revolution generated by revolving a circle in a three-dimensional space about an axis coplanar with a circle. Okay, it's like a circle moving within three dimensions, let's just say, it, put it that way. Hmm? It's a donut. Like a donut, yeah. Um, so the top topological significance associated with the torus, notably as a dynamically emergent structure. The fluid dynamics that sustain the coherence of the torus as a dynamic structure centered on a void. I don't know if a black hole could be described then as a kind of torus, but maybe we can discuss that in the discussion. So science has notably advanced over the past century through the recognition of the special conditions associated with more and more extreme degrees of vacuum and has enabled the technology to achieve them. Although more dubious scientific research has focused on sensory deprivation, the possible role 
of a form of cognitive void has only been explored through mod modes of knowing unrecognized by science. So given the organizing dynamics associated with voids, how might a cognitive a void dance come to be understood? So might such an understanding not prove highly relevant to the sense of meaninglessness and pointlessness characteristic of the many, including scientists, tortured by existential doubt and experiential challenges to their very sense of identity? How is it that those who consider themselves most closely associated with the advancement of knowledge through their various professional communities disparage other contexts as places where nothing happens? Is this sense fundamental to most communities who attach little significance to what happens elsewhere? And the possibility arises that everything is happening elsewhere. So is nothing happening in most places? Or is everything happening elsewhere? How is this related to the sense that leads to their being caricatured as wholes, possibly characterized by a dynamic into which it is dangerous to be drawn, like into a black hole. So we use these kinds of conditions and we describe them in terms of a social void. This may be understood to be inhabited by the marginalized and losers then characterized as political zeros or social zeros. Um, such, as a void may, um, such a void may also be understood as a feeling of lack of identity with average sized groups, institutions, or associations. Zero is also used to caricature those who have opposing views, intellectuals or women. Um, the social void is also associated with discussion of corporate governance and of the consequence in developing countries of departing colonial powers. So there is a case for exploring the degree to which avoiding is effectively a form of intimate sensing to be contrasted with conventionally understood uses of the senses of vision, hearing, tasting, feeling, and smelling. The latter senses may then be considered as various modalities of remote sensing, whereby more meaningful engagement is effectively avoided. By contrast, the nature of intimate integration has been eloquently described by David Abram in his um, book um, from, in, from 90, 1997 called The Spell of the Sensuous, Perception and Language in a More Than Human World. So this cognitive digestion calls for a stronger set of complementary clarifying metaphors associated with the process of avoiding. So I want to just finish off here um, by asking the question <laughs> of sustainable avoidance. So past decades have dramatically demonstrated the incapacity of collectives to articulate strategies that ensure agreement amongst a wide range of stakeholders that attract appropriate resources in practice rather than broken promises and that prove capable of effective implementation rather than empty talk in all of these spheres like healthcare and, well, there's slogans, healthcare for all, jobs for all, education for all, justice for all. So decision making in response to climate change offers the most recent example of this kind of thinking. Um, perhaps the apparently dysfunctional avoidance of remedial strategy making and implementation could be reframed as indicative of the need for more radical insight into strategic indirectness, grounded in a form of avoid dance. Rather than deplore collective strategic inadequacies based on ineffectual agreement, perhaps other forms of collective insightful initiative can be based on the avoidance of global decision making. Is there indeed a collective art of not doing to be discovered as purportedly cultivated at the highest levels of the classical Chinese imperium? John Brockman, uh, a literary agent, runs the science and philosophy site edge.org. And every year for the last 20 years, he's asked leading thinkers to answer a particular question, such as, what questions have disappeared? Or, what do you believe is true even though you cannot prove it? Or, what scientific idea is ready for retirement? In 2008, however, Brockman announced that he has no more questions left. So he asked the final question, 
what is the last question? So I want to ask you, for what question will you be remembered? For you, what is the last question? <laughs>